Mark's world is about to crumble <laughs> into a heap of rumble. This is fantastic to be here with you guys. What do you do with Christian realism? Uh, sometimes I blur that with Christian idealism in a realist world. And that's exactly what Woodrow Wilson faced 100 years ago. And it's a difficult situation. President Wilson was elected in 1912 in one of the most contentious races in American history, up until recently, that is, anyway. There was a three-party split. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the previous Republican president, ran for what some considered his third term. Now, he came in as a result of an assassination, and he said, no, that, was not, that was, did not count. So I'm going to run for a second term. And, and the Republican establishment really didn't like him because he was kind of a progressive. They said, nope, that's a third term, and we're going to put up Taft as an opponent. So Teddy Roosevelt's like, fine, I'll create my own party, the Bull Moose Party. It's a great idea. Split the vote. It was a close race, too, even with a split vote, and Woodrow Wilson won. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have been president had, had Teddy not split, or the establishment not, not caused Teddy Roosevelt to split. So here we go. Woodrow Wilson's excited. Uh, a strong pres Presbyterian man, probably one of the most devout presidents we have. He was very serious about his faith. Um, he's a bit of a complex man. I think most, you could say that about any of us, though. I, I don't know how far do you take that. There seemed to be a problem in Doug Mastriano's mind, and, and maybe if you disagree, we can have a good, robust discussion there in Q&A. In, in my studies of Woodrow Wilson, it seems he had a problem applying what he knew from Scripture to his policies in life. There, there seemed to be a rift, a conflict there, and that he had trouble reconciling. And I hope to hit some of those points here in the next, next 20 minutes or so. Uh, the interesting thing is he's, he's elected in tw uh, 1912, and he, right before, uh, as we're heading towards inauguration, he makes a comment to a friend. He says, as only he could say, it would be the irony of fate if my administration was marked chiefly by foreign affairs. Hmm. What do you think is going to happen to him? <laughs> he has a great domestic plan. He's the first president to throw out the baseball in a World Series. I mean, he's got a very domestic approach to everything, much as many Democrat candidates do, by the way. And that's not a critique. That's an observation. But then in 1914, he smacked dab in the middle of his face with World War I. And World War I happens, and, we, and most of us, you know, look, I, I just, my, my next book here that, that came out a few months ago is called Thunder in the Argonne. It, it deals with the American contribution in the last six weeks of the war. But obviously as a scene, scene setter, I had to do a chapter on World War I, what was it? You know, tr trying to take, make logic out of that stew and mess of complex alliances and the du Archduke of Austria-Hungary and then the Serbs and why did the Russians want, want to protect the Serbs as Slavic brothers. It's not easy to understand now, 100 years later. It was really hard in 1914. You know, whoa, why, why are these people fighting? I thought there was an assassination in, in the Balkans, and now we have Germany invading Belgium, and the Russians are mobilizing for war. And this is one reason why the United States was hesitant to enter World War I. There, was, there were several more reasons. Of course, we had the legacy of George Washington's farewell address, stay out of foreign entanglements, stay out of European entanglements. That's what he specifically said or meant. Okay, got it. So within a week of the Germans invading Belgium, big cataclysm breaking out in Belgium and France, Woodrow Wilson issues a public statement on America's policy on this, and he says, and I quote, my policy is for the United States to remain neutral in word and deed and thought. Don't even think about entering the war. How exactly do you do this? You see where I'm going? In a, in a liberalist, idealist tradition, yeah, that would be nice, but what do you do when German U-boats start sinking ships or vessels with your people on board, with your citizens on board? That's where the idea that you can't you know, think or even think about war because it violates the terms of neutrality becomes a bit ridiculous there. Okay, but let me take this step by step. 1914 drones on. Everybody's sure it's going to be a quick war. The Germans, the French, even the English, who had a relatively small army, it's going to be a quick war because our economies are too interconnected in Europe. We have a global system with the colonial empires. It's, it's just it, we cannot do it so long. But guess what? They are all wrong. The famous Paris Expo in 1889, a lot of people like us thinking about these things came out and said, yeah, the war can only last a few months before all the economies in Europe will be brought to their knees. Well, no, they weren't. All the governments managed to find workarounds. It wasn't easy. For Germany in particular, with, with an embargo by the French and British fleets, it was going to cause starvation eventually of the population. So the workarounds weren't always necessarily very good, but it kept the nations at war. Okay, 1914, we go from a maneuver warfare, it ends up in trenches, and then 
1915. And Woodrow Wilson, okay, he's been dealing with his domestic policies, not really paying much attention, until the Germans are starting to get desperate. They're, they're facing the Russians on the Eastern Front, and this is the Russians. Now look, the Germans had two great victories at Tannenberg, destroyed two Russian armies, but then more, Russians have more armies showing up, and the Germans are like, what are we going to do? And the British, or the British uh, Expeditionary Force, the 80,000 men that showed up in Belgium in, in August 1914 that, that really mucked up the German plan and prevented the, the Schlieffen plan from working. They were mostly destroyed, but the British had more soldiers. Guess who came? The Canadians showed up. The Indians came. Soldiers from across the empire are going to hold the line until the British could recruit a new army in that's going to show up in 1916. And the Germans like, we don't have an, you know, sealess access to, uh, to men and resources. We have to try to win this quickly because we're surrounded. We have wars on all fronts. Okay. Well, the Kaiser comes up with the idea with the unleashing unrestricted submarine warfare. And the, sub the submariners working for the Kaiser, he's got a fairly sizable fleet. He, he thinks he, they, we, they could sink, sink enough ships that they could starve British, knock British out of the war with the indirect approach, as, as Little Hart would say. And so German U-boat commanders, they're trying to abide by the laws of war as it was understood in the time. The German commander will spot a merchant vessel. They'll come out of, wa they'll, they'll come out of the water. They'll signal to the ship that they're going to sink them and give the, the personnel on the vessel time to, to get off. And then after everyone, everyone's off, they get the, the signal from the captain of the ship that's about to be sunk, the, the merchantman ca captain, they'd sink it. Well, we'll start with, what, 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 it's, it's very proper. But the only problem is when you have uh, merchantmen starting to put guns on, on the decks of their merchant vessels. And in one case, the commander of the USS Collier, when a German commander comes up out of the sea to, to properly announce he's going to sink the ship and, and you know, get, get your guys off before I sink it, the commander of the Collier, a British vessel, rams the submarine and he's celebrated as a great hero in London. And Germans like, okay, that's enough of that garbage. You sink him on sight. Okay. This doesn't play well, though. So here's the problem. 1915, who's getting their story out? The British and French. The British and French are, are great at, now all sides are doing propaganda. We have ridiculous co propaganda coming out of the British and French of, of German soldiers walking around with babies on the tips of their bayonets. There were atrocities by the leading German units, by some of, some of the Prussian Guard units, based off their experience fighting in France in, uh, in 1870, where, where French guerrillas were hiding in buildings. So if there were, anyone was shot at, it was brutal rep reprisal initially. So some of that's true. But a lot of it was exaggerated because the Germans never had a counter story that worked well. Here's the problem, transparency. American journalists say to the British and French, can we go to the trenches and see for ourselves? They're like, yes, please come. Germans, can we go? Nope, you can't come in here. So who's getting their story out? And it works that way internationally. And this is starting to plague President Wilson, who's ignoring and trying to avoid war. And at the same time, he's drug into it. America is one of the most powerful nations economically at the time. And in fact, it was during World War I that the economic center of the world shifted from Europe to the United States an established fact. A lot of that was based off the United States selling so many war goods and other goods to the belligerents. The United States, as a neutral power and as a leader of the neutral states, uh, sold goods to anyone who'd buy it. There was one problem. Geography. Who has better access to geography and to the sea lanes? Germany or Britain? France or Germany? Yeah, you see where I'm going? And this is fantastic. The British, British have a policy just like they did in the 1800s. We see any American vessel loaded with goods, we're going to stop and inspect it. If, it head, it's, if, if it's headed towards Germany or Austria-Hungary, we're going to stop and embargo that ship. And the French say, that is a very bad idea. We want to win the Americans over. We want to win their hearts. So we, yes, if the, if the cargo is headed towards our, our enemy, we're going to buy it at full market price. And the British like, even if the Americans already paid for it, yes, even if they paid a German for it, we're going to buy it off them and then let them go, not Shanghai their crew, not do anything to the vessel. And so now things are starting to shift from a brilliant information operations campaign for the Allies. Now there's another problem in the United States. There's a lot of issues in the United States. The United States population is about 100,000, I'm sorry, 100 million people at the time. 31 million of those people were born overseas many of them from Germany. So you see a conflict, and from Turkey, and from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So you see a bias there. So Wilson doesn't want to get into this war. So in 1915, he, he has an earlier version of a reset. He, he, and he really believes, he said, this reminds me a lot of the previous presidential administration, all I need to do is talk to them, and I could talk them out of war. I'm, I'm such a brilliant man. And so he, President Wilson gets together with, with the leaders from Germany, uh, England, and France separately and just says, we just need to talk about peace. 
And out of frustration, the French ambassador to the United States, Jean Jusseron, Jusseron says, at a, a, after pleasantly and patiently listening to the president, he finally blurts out, OK, I'll accept peace on behalf of France as soon as you give, convince the Germans to give the, our men, the lives of our dead men back. OK, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it finally sunk in. But he's kind of like, hmm, what do you do with that? 1915 is a failed year. Germans start attacking more vessels. 1916, the Germans are getting desperate. No one can break the trenches on the Western Front. Then in 1915, the year before, the, the British and French in desperation try a flanking strategy, attack through modern-day Turkey called the Dardanelles Campaign. It fails. It seems like we're stuck fighting the Western Front. There needs to be a breakthrough. The Germans are getting desperate as well. And so in 1916, they unleash again unrestricted submarine warfare. The Kaiser. He, he's, he's been very hesitant to give the order to, to uh, unleash hell, sink everything you see, because he's afraid the United States might be drugged into this war. But the United States, under President Wilson, his policies, what did I say? Don't even think, talk, or, or, or imagine war in any way. He does nothing to prepare the United States for war. The United States Army at this time is 200,000 men who are chasing guerrillas in Cuba and chasing guerrillas in the Philippines and, and patrolling the, the, the frontier, you know, the, the Indian reservations. It's a frontier colonial army. It's not ready for modern war. The Kaiser's looking at that. So you know what? It might just be worth the risk. The United States has done nothing. Especially to show you how bad it was at the presidential level, the uh, United States Army War College Commandant, Montgomery Miggs Malcolm, two-star general, he's looking at this in 1915 into 16. He goes, it looks like the United States is going to be dragged into this war. And so he pulls his staff together at the War College to start thinking about war. What do we need to consider and plan for should we be forced into this war? Because you can't do a cold start. And President Wilson hears about this, and he tells the commandant, you can't do that. That's warmongering. How dare you think about war? And so the Army and, and the Navy and all the services can't even think about it. And they step back, and they just, OK, I guess if it comes, it comes. And we'll have to deal with the calamity that goes with it. Okay, 1916, things are looking rough for the Germans. There's a fierce battle outside Verdun, about a million casualties. The Battle of the Somme, about a million casualties, Western Front. It's, it's awful. How long can this go on? And so, okay, it's time for uh, unlimited, unrestricted submarine warfare from Germany. And the Germans unleash this. And in, in May, they sink this civilian vessel called the Lusitania, Lusitania with 198 Americans on board. And President, when this happens, President Wilson is, is stru struck into action. He immediately orders the, the militaries to expand and double their size. He, he puts the industry on war. No, he doesn't do any of that. He issues a stern warning to the Kaiser saying, if you do that again, I'll consider that as deliberately hostile to the United States. You've got to be kidding me. It's called the, the, the harsh notes that he sent to, to, uh, to the President Wilson, uh, to the Kaiser. And the Kaiser's just like, okay, this guy's not a serious actor here. You, how do you take someone serious like that? There's, there's no meat behind this. It's just, it's just empty words. And that's where I see Christian liberalism at an extreme level, probably idealism at this level, getting slapped in the face with a, with a Kaiser, very Bismarckian kind of realism in his approach to life. And it's hard to balance that. How do you balance the war as we want, the world as we want it to be, as opposed to the world as it really is. As one of the great theorists of land power that I follow is Karl von Clausewitz. He's a Napoleonic oppression officer. And he says you have two types of war, real war and war on paper. And that's exactly the problem we have here with, with the idealism and the realism getting smacked into the seas there, the Atlantic Ocean with German U-boats patrolling it. By May 19, by January 1917, over 200 Americans are dead at the hands of German U-boats. And President Wilson is now having a problem talking his way out of this. The problem is he's painted himself into a corner. Because in the 1916 presidential elections, what was one of his bumper stickers? Could anyone help me what it was? Yes. Man, take the rest of the day off, brother. The bumper sticker was he kept us out of the war. And so President Wilson is very proud. And in fact, there's one statement. That he, one of his campaign buttons has his picture in a round, and it says, he proved the pen mightier than the sword. And then he gives a speech where Teddy Roosevelt basically calls him a coward. You have Teddy Roosevelt's advocating, Pre prepare for war. It's coming. Prepare. And Wilson's like, don't listen to that warmonger. It's a lot like today with a name calling you. He's a hater. You know, don't listen to that guy. <clears throat> and Teddy Roosevelt, um, and he rebuffs Teddy Roosevelt and goes, and it's this arrogant tone from, from his Christian liberalism. It's just, 
you can, you can never say that perhaps I'm wrong for being too proud to fight. It's like, what? You got a bully down here beating up the little kids, Belgium and other guys, and you're just going to like, well, no, I'm, I'm above fighting. I mean, just, it's fantastic. There's some great uh, spoofs and cartoons of the time. It, the Australians are really frustrating the United States. Australia is part of the, the British Empire. It's a Commonwealth country. And so they have a, 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 a laughing running cartoon every week about Woodrow Wilson's typewriter. And in one of the scenes there, they say, Woodrow Wilson's typewriter, the war is as far away from Woodrow Wilson as his typewriter is as far as running out of ribbon. I mean, it's, it's that bad. So he's a la laughing stock. 1917. Okay, the war's going on. He kept us out of the war. The United States Army is still a, is smaller than the pre-war Belgium Army, about 200,000 soldiers. Belgium started off the war with 250,000. You've got to be kidding me. If you look at the statistics, we're between Belgium and that, that, that great warrior people that President Trump talked about, Montenegro. Well, anyway, <laughs> they're really not that warlike. The Montenegrin army today, by the way, is smaller than Chambers, Chambersburg High School that I spoke at yesterday. <laughs> so they're not going to march off and drag us into World War III, I assure you. <laughs> So anyway, 1917 comes, Wilson has his second term, he's re-inaugurated, and then more Americans are being killed on board vessels by the German U-boats. The Germans are doing this to try to starve the British out of the war. It's a desperate act. I'm not sympathetic or empathetic to it, it's, it is what it is. But then it finally, the straw that breaks the camel's back, what, what happens, is, what, what is intercepted by British intelligence? It's a Zimmerman telegram. So as Foreign Secretary, very good, you, you can also take the rest of the weekend off, thank you for that. The, the foreign, foreign Secretary Zimmerman is, is believed the United States might actually enter the war. I don't know where, he, where he's getting this idea from, but in his worst fears, having the United States enter with its vast resources and unlimited access to men would be a bad thing for Germany. And so Zimmerman sends a secret message off to the to leadership in Mexico City saying, hey, we will back you if you invade the American Southwest and retake southern part of California, Arizona, New Mexico, and, and parts of Texas. We're with you. And, and British, intelligence, British intelligence intercepts this, passes it off to Woodrow Wilson's administration, and a reporter, of course, this is viewed as propaganda. This is British propaganda to drag us into war. The British are warmongering, according to w Wilson. But a reporter asked Foreign Secretary Zimmerman, a very upright Christian man in Berlin, did you send that message? And he wouldn't lie. <laughs> yeah, I, yes, I did send that message. Okay, thanks. You, your country is now ruined. So even Woody Wilson couldn't talk his way out of this whole thing. The United States is dragged into a war it's not ready for. Wilson asked Congress, both, both houses, to declare war on the 2nd of April. The first vote's on the 4th. The second vote by the Senate's on the 6th. War's declared. And now we're going. And then Wilson goes from, from this pacifist here, trying to get along with the Germans, to his administration, or threatening, threatening to hang every German ethnic German in, the, in America from, from a lamppost. I mean, this, how'd you go from this loving, tolerant sort of person to somebody who's going to crush any, dis any dissidents in your country? It's that bad. You can listen to a quote from Wilson's ambassador. When war was declared, Kaiser Wilhelm threatening, made a threat to the ambassador, the American ambassador, said, look, you're coming into war, but there's so many Germans in your country, they speak German, they read German, that I'll have, I'll have a second army in North America. And the American ambassador, Woodrow Wilson's guy, said, you know what, we have more lampposts than we have Germans, and we're going to hang every one of those son of a guns from them if they do that. And I was like, well, what happened to those, those loving, tolerant, liberal Christian idealists? How easy it fades. So we're at war, but we're not ready. 200,000-man army, a draft comes in. It's going to go to 4.1 million people in two years. What's the quality of the soldiers? Terrible. We're going to use 1914 tactics to fight a 1918 war. It's so bad that in my new book I talk about how the Germans, the enemy, who are defending their, their lives, their position from Ger American attacks, they're facing, facing 28th Pennsylvania Division, old Keystone Division. And I, I have quotes from them saying, why are the Americans attacking us this way in lines? We're, just, we're killing too many of them. You know it's bad when your enemy says, feels bad for you like that, and just stacks of American soldiers. And, this is thanks, President Wilson, for not, doing, not lifting a finger in the times of peace to prepare us for war. I like, uh, I like the idea, the strategic frame of you know, peace through strength, trust but verify. The, these are proven things across the millennia. We are living in a fallen world, corrupt with sin, and the same spats that we have with neighbors, nations have with also their neighbors at a different level because they're armed to the teeth and there's no one to police them necessarily. Maybe UN, but we could debate that. And so... <laughs> 
And so the United States, 100 years ago today, 100 years ago today, the United States is in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. It's one of the largest and, and one of the bloodiest periods in American history, and it's for all but forgotten. 1.2 million Americans are fighting in the Meuse-Argonne right now, facing the Germany's best divisions. This is not hyper hyperbole, because the Americans were asked by the first Supreme Allied Commander, it's not Eisenhower, it's a Frenchman, Ferdinand Foch, he had a, a grand offensive plan to ne knock the Germans out of the war a year earlier than anyone believed possible, and leading the attack were the Americans in Germany's most vulnerable point. And so the Germans had to ship all the reserve divisions, all 24 reserve divisions, to stop the Americans, which include their vaunted Prussian guards. And so our boys are dying out there. It's vicious. 20,000 casualties a week. That, you know, that basically, that's Vietnam in two and a half weeks. No, no, look, I said casualties, not deaths, so we can only draw that parallel so, so far. But it, it's that bad. And amongst those are great Christians that, that we might know today, like Sergeant Alvin York. Obviously, he's near and dear to my heart. But a Christian who wrestled with many of the topics that we're talking about today, 100 years later, you know, the just war theory. How can I, as a Christian, thou shalt not kill, love your neighbor yourself, how can I defend my country you know, and take another man's life? And Alvin York wrestled with that. And in the end, his resolution came in the face of a German machine gun. And he was compelled to stop the killing by killing, which is an interesting twist on the whole thing. He ended up killing 25 Germans in this one battle and, and capturing 132, broke the German lines and changed history. And I can make the case help end the war faster. Th and this is somebody that was viewed as a good-for-nothing drunk from nowhere, Tennessee. But God got a hold of his life two years earlier, saved him. He was a strong, born-in Christian, loved the Lord. And his life, legacy, and testimony echoes us to us 100 years later. And I think God has a plan for, that, for all of us that way. It says in the Revelations 12, 11, we overcome Satan. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So your testimony is a powerful thing. And I think that's one good thing to do as historians or thinkers on this to to topic here is, is not to shy away from the Christian elements and the Christian perspectives and the Christian people who shed light on these dark topics. Okay, let's wrap this up here. Maybe we'll have a minute for questions. So the war goes on. We're not ready for it. The, the French are the arsenal of democracy. Every tank the Americans drive are French tanks. There's a few British ones, but the French are supplying us with aircraft. No American tank makes it to, to battle. No American aircraft makes it to combat. It's all French equipment. And that's what happens. You beg, borrow, steal. We're, we're wearing British-style helmet, helmets. Most of our weapons are Enfields, which are designed for the British, just retooled for a 3 6 ammunition. So this, this is a nation going to war, not ready for it. And it's the sad thing to me is the idealists and, and Christian liberals sitting in Washington, D.C., they're not the ones that paid the price, nor any of their sons. It was sons and daughters from people like you and me. They're going to pay the price for a flawed, a, flailed, a failed, uh, foolish strategy that lacked vigilance, or I would say even prudent preparations for war. 20,000 men a week. The war ended on 11th November, you know, it, and it was very poetic. When the Germans came across and, and, and the agreement was made to end the war early on the 11th of November, it was decided we'll, we'll end the war at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Okay. The war is ending. Word gets out to almost all the units by 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. Does Pershing, Field Marshal Haig, Peyton from France, do they order the men to stop attacking? Nope, full steam ahead. We're going to have 11,000 casualties across 11, uh, the Western Front in just five hours of fighting. And of course, the American population, and when they read Private Gunter from Baltimore, where I spoke two days ago, he died at 10.59 in the morning, one minute before the ceasefire, the, the Congress is like, what, what were you guys thinking? Colonel Babcock from the 353rd Regiment, 89th Army Divisions, said, that, yes, in the last hours of the war, there were officers glory hunting, and he's right. So now you have an, an opposite class. You have the realism and, and, well, you have the idealism and liberalism on one side, and then you have the realists out of control. No, we got to control that last hill. It's only an armistice. You know, it, it, the war could break out again, which is just folly. And so in this last story, and I'll give you a minute for questions here. The second division, which is uh, one third Marine, two third Army, second division's order to do a river crossing operation the last day of the war. This is a big deal. The Germans are on the hills above, butchering the Marines and soldiers from the 89th Division supporting them. And the Marines are pressing up the hill, and the Marines notice that 11, the word didn't get to them because all the runners with the message the war's over are being killed at the bridge. There's stacks of bodies, hundreds of bodies stacked up there, armies, and Army men and, and Marines. Finally, at 11 o'clock, the, uh, the, the Marines start noticing the Germans are missing their targets. 
The Germans are shooting around the Marines at 11 o'clock, trying to slow them down, not wanting to kill anymore. And then finally, a message gets through and says, the war ended 10 minutes ago. What are you doing? He's like, we didn't know, but we were wondering why the Germans stopped killing us. And thus ended the Great War. Wilson comes out of the war, of course, uh, with his 14 points that he develops actually in January 1918. And that frames and shapes American policy to this day. The ideological heir of, of Woodrow Wilson and his thinking is Barack Obama in, in all levels, domestically and internationally. On foreign policy wise, Woodrow Wilson's fingerprints are all over both Bushes and Clinton. The idea of democracies and republics being the best safeguard against war. That's a Wilsonian concept. And so now we have Wil Wilson the ideals of Wilsonian democracy here and ex wanting to expand our ideology to other, uh, other nations almost as a gospel. So he secularized Christianity politically in a lot of ways. And that's why he saw moves to you know, impose a republic or democracy on Iraq in 2003 where so many of you fought. It's a great idea in a country that had no culture or tradition to do that. And how, how well did we get it right when we had to fight American Civil War to straighten it out? So anyway, thank you for your attention. Uh, we have like a minute or two for questions there, so please jump up and fire away. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your lecture. I actually heard the YouTube version that you gave uh, a couple of years ago Thank as you. well. Um, on the topic, thinking more strategically and preparing for war, um, one of the big concerns of, of strong nations and empires that you know, go overseas, fight a lot, and get into debt is that they end up collapsing and then they're not able to protect their strategic national interests. Of course, like the, the, the national debt of the U.S. is a big concern for, for many folks and many like joint chiefs have talked about it as well. Um, and even today, you know, we don't sell war bonds like we did in World War II, et cetera. What, what is the concept, you think, between um, preventing the U.S. from being another empire that spends um, too much overseas, gets overextended, and particularly with the link to like the U.S. debt as, as the main factor in that? Thank you. And what was your name, sir? Uh, Kyle. Nice to meet you. Thank you. That's a great question, too, and I, and I appreciate that. You know, it's a hard thing, and the, way, the, the place I'm going to go is where the president seems to be obsessed and focused on, on burden sharing. So we're in a North Atlantic Treaty Organization, now 30 members with the warlike Montenegrins and now the Macedonians, great nations both with very small armies, not aggressive, not going to drag us into a war. At least, well, I guess that you could say that about Sarajevo and Archduke Ferdinand. You just never know. But 30 nations, what's the purpose of, Na of NATO? And NATO is clearly a, a funny story. I was on my way from Heidelberg, Germany to Stuttgart some years ago on, on a, on a streetcar, and this well-dressed German engineer said, well, what do you do for a living? And I'm a historian. He's like, what a waste. Ha <laughs> ha, what a joke. You can't do nothing with history. I'm an engineer. I'm a scientist. We do good things for Germany. And I said, I'm sure glad that, that Colonel Marshall in 1918 and, and in 1919 watched the Treaty of Versailles being unfolded and how we vanqu the Germans were vanquished as an enemy. And then when it was the United States turned to learn from history, we reapplied the lessons. And instead of beating you down, even though you were an evil empire and killed lots of Jews and did other nasty things, we raised you up as a friend and built you up. And you had this great economy and protection and no World War III. Thanks to the United States of America learning from its mistakes with its with this dalliance with the League of Nations and what have you after World War I. And he's like, whoa, never thought about that. Okay. <laughs> to answer your question directly, NATO is the result of two world wars, and it's all about burden sharing. So we have 30 nations that, that pledge to spend 2% of their gross domestic product on defense, and of the 30, Thanks to Trump, we're up to eight. When he took over, there was only five nations doing their pledge 2% on defense. So we have the richest country in Germany that the president likes to hit and that I like to hit is Germany. Margaret Merkel, with her arrogant, bombastic attitude toward the United States, with, with the, her insistent denigration of Americans, of your contribution to saving that nation from a World War III, of providing a circumstance where they can have this nice EU and enjoy all these benefits, that's thanks to the United States of America, not any goodwill within Europe itself. This, this, this is the longest period of peace they've had since Napoleon, even the Congress of Vienna, because Congress of Vienna was disrupted by the, the riots of 1848. So that ended that peace. And America's provided them peace, and they, and they kind of spit at us and, and, and kind of mock it. The Germans with just over 1% of, on defense. Germany, the people that perfected armor warfare, you know how many tanks they have today? Just as a measure of where they are, 210 tanks. You've got to be kidding me. 
the Polish president, the pre not, not the current one, Doda, the previous one, he said, there was a day when I was afraid the Germans had too many tanks, but today they have too few. You know it's a problem when Poland says that. So how do, how do we not outspend ourselves is demand our allies around the world, and that includes the allies that we have mutual defense treaties with, and we have a lot. We, all, all 30 of the NATO brothers and sisters cough up, do more for your own defense. That includes the other countries such as Taiwan, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, who so instead of using this, this pledge from the United States to protect them, come to their defense in war as a, as a way to undercut on defense and just rely on Uncle Sugar to pay for them. No, you, you got to do your part too. Yes, you're an important friend, we'll be there for you, but we expect and demand that you have an adequate force. Philippines. Philippines have been low-balling us for years because we've been protecting them. We have a mutual defense treaty with them, so why should they worry? And then uh, they tell us to leave the Philippines, and then the Chinese start grabbing Spratly Islands and the, the Sharper Shoals, and they're like, oh, we need you back, we don't have a navy. Well, get one. Mark, do we have time for one more? Is that it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Quick question on trade. You mentioned that uh, World War I, everyone assumed that trade relationships would prevent war. Uh, we, of course, have the same situation with China right now, where people have assumed that uh, extensive dependence on China for trade would somehow prevent conflict. Uh, there's a long history of this, the 30 years war, people made the same assumption in the early years uh, that it just couldn't possibly happen because everyone was trading. Uh, can you just kind of address that, that assumption and what happens as a result of it? Yes, yeah, so China's a tough one. I, I think we're, we're still at a point where we could, we could shape that relationship in, in a way where it need not be one that we go to war, but there's so many points of contention between us and the Chinese. That, that land grab and island building campaign in the South China Sea is very troubling. And really the only nation uh, exercising the freedom of navigation to there is the United States. So from time to time we'll flow out, fly an aircraft over or, or put a, a Navy vessel through, a ship through there, just, yes, we're here. And of course the Chinese, you can't do that, this is our territory. And we're like, no, we don't recognize that. But when we stop doing that, de facto, they already have the land. So we've, the past 10 years, when, when they were allowed to build these islands out of these shoals and, and, and rocks and what have you, it, things have changed dramatically, and that's going to be a problem. Why is it a problem? Because 80 percent of trade out of that region goes to the Malacca Straits, which is by the South China Sea. This is a big deal. Um, the other points of contention, of course, are Taiwan. China has a one-China policy, and we don't, and so what are you going to do with that? And we have a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. That's the only reason why they're still free and independent, because Uncle, Uncle Sam has promised to come to their defense if attacked. So this is a really hard one. I, I pray God that we could work together with the Chinese. I, I think the rise of Christianity might be a saving grace for us in China. That's my view on that because you're going to, I think the, the atheism and, and secularism that's there is going to be pushed aside and they're, they're going to find more in common with us. But the Germans and the British were both Protestant nations in 1914 and didn't stop them. So once you get into a clash of nations over severe and deep-rooted national security interests, we're in a dangerous area. So I pray God can lead us in a direction where China could be a good regional power and the United States maintains its position as a, as a world power and that we just don't clash over those minor issues in the sea there or elsewhere. We do have a hope though, Vietnam wants to be our best friend because they have a common enemy in China and uh, Vietnam's nat natural enemy has always been historically until the recent times, China. Thank you for your time. God bless you all. I look forward to a great day. Thank you.